So it's spinning. Okay, now the meeting is being recorded. So welcome, Rob. Uh, and we hope that uh, you will keep on coming year after year to update us on the latest on wireless. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, hopefully that doesn't correspond to the Gs. Um, then it would be only once every 10 years. So first, thank you, Pentalis, for in inviting me. Um, it's nice to be in front of you guys. Um, just a word of introduction about myself. Uh, so I work in uh, Nokia and Bell Labs. Uh, I have really sort of two roles. Um, I lead uh, what I would consider to be um, all the cloud RAN or virtualized RAN, that's radio access network architecture innovation projects that are ongoing in Bell Labs. And we have about half a dozen or so different projects that are related to sort of the future of the radio access network and what will happen as we move forward and virtualize more assets um, in the RAN. And then I also have a dotted line responsibility to report to the head of wireless uh, for uh, Nokia as one of two CTOs. Um, we are very much focused, at least in my team right now, on uh, doing a lot of startup innovation. Um, I am looking for interns, uh, especially those with a cloud background, um, telecom background actually discouraged. We have plenty of telecom people. So if you have um, real-time cloud background, um, please feel free to drop me a note. Patels knows how to get in touch with me. Um, we'll be looking for some interns in the spring for sure, um, although even possibly in uh, uh, January. Uh, all virtual, of course, in this virtual world. Um, yeah, Pentalis is right. We've, we've had a long journey together. Um, we started working together on WCDMA and release 99 uh, 3G. That was quite a long time ago, it seems. Um, in our industry, we generally get a new G every 10 years. Uh, but one of the things that's happened at least, uh, 4G and 5G is we actually tried to go a little bit faster um, based on what happened with 4G. So 4G uh, brought with it um, much higher data rates than 3G, a very extended mobile broadband experience, uh, an ability to allow uh, machines to reliably communicate um, so we can get to reasonable levels of reliability. Otherwise, wireless is more or less best effort, and the protocols are kind of designed in such a way that it makes the links resilient uh, against both latency and um, lock air rate or dropped frames or dropped packets. Um, for New 5G, of course, that's a slightly different story. Late in the LT era, we introduced um, what would be considered to be cellular IoT. Um, IoT has been around for a while, um, but at the same time, introducing it at a wide scale in a cellular network beyond just sort of taking a GSM chipset and embedding it in a device was done sort of strategically in um, release 13 of LTE. So somewhere around 2015, 2016, we got something called narrowband IoT and something called category M. These were essentially narrowband devices that could piggyback off of the 4G spectrum uh, and use it. Uh, so this was in primary focal points. When we get to 5G, everything is better. Um, that seems to be the first focus was to try to make essentially uh, broadband become extreme broadband. So going from targeted rates of one and a half gig to around 10 gigabits per second, also enabling um, a number of features so that the 5G focus shifts from being largely a consumer network uh, into something which is now focused on improving uh, industrial automation applications. This is now sort of expected based on the changes, the new standard that has just been introduced, which ironically was somewhat delayed by COVID um, because they limit our ability to travel and have standards meetings. So it seems that it's difficult to interact Initially, believe it or not, um, because there, the, the um, distribution of um, delegates around the world were um, limited in their connectivity, they actually made the meetings all email only, which is actually quite a strange circumstance, given that we're all used to Zoom or Google Meets or Teams or WebEx or otherwise. Um, now they have at least some in-person meetings, but can you imagine trying to design things with folks strictly through email? Um, because these are folks you wouldn't normally pick up the phone and call. So a number of challenges um, in trying to move forward and to what's coming next, uh, specifically on um, release 16. And then with release 17, we'll get to see uh, further enhancements with essentially massive machine communication. So going from cellular IoT to narrowband IoT to even further to supporting literally millions of devices potentially at scale at, at very low cost um, and managing them in the same spectrum and then on the same network 
that people are expecting to watch videos on and have a very good sort of broadband experience. So um, 5G at least is expected to sort of redefine both um, the usage for humans, but also really create a new paradigm for indus how industries will use uh, connections con connectivity. So how do they do that? Well, it starts with capacity. Um, capacity is obtained a number of different ways. And we can think of capacity in uh, the simplest term by adding spectrum. So with 5G, we get more spectrum. And you probably hear a lot in the US in particular about new spectrum licenses, new spectrum licenses and auctions that are ongoing. They just closed the CBRS auction. Um, number, it is a very flexible model for the allocation of spectrum because the spectrum is multi-use and shared by the US government. Uh, but spectrum also in the millimeter wave band, this is the key difference for 5G. So lots and lots and lots of spectrum available. And that's kind of highlighted in the upper right. You can see my cursor. Um, literally gigahertz worth of bandwidth is now available um, and literally billions of dollars being spent. And you saw the new iPhone launch a couple of weeks ago and it is millimeter wave capable. Um, this was a pretty big deal. Uh, several for the last couple of years, we've been having lots of interesting engagements with Apple as they decided whether or not to enter this space of supporting millimeter wave. We're going to talk a little bit about the physical challenges of millimeter wave in a minute. But bottom line is, is it's not the easiest frequency to deploy. So um, millimeter wave gives a spectrum. Uh, there's new bands coming between 3.6 gigahertz and 3.8 gigahertz. I mentioned the CBRS band uh, just opened up. So spectrum is part of the equation. Then we have space. Um, with space, no, it's not the final frontier. It's just yet another frontier for wireless. Uh, for us, space is about literally having um, sort of intelligent reuse of spectrum and power in such a way that we use space as our advantage. Um, so if you go down into the clutter, we know that cells start to get insulated from each other. So lamppost space installs allow us to actually extend capacity at the expense of more cells. So if we deploy more cells, then we get higher capacity. Um, in the millimeter wave context, the, the advantage of that is because it doesn't propagate very far, we don't have to deal with all the complex interference problems that we normally experience when we try to densify a network uh, like we'd expect to see with massive MIMO. So with massive MIMO, we have a slightly different paradigm. This is taking our existing um, uh, antenna sites and now increasing massively the number of antennas, physical antennas that we put there. And then we exploit space and frequency time to be able to schedule multiple users at the same time. Um, this concept is called massive MIMO, but it really is just a very smart way of doing beam forming. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So some of the challenges, of course, with massive MIMO is that this really uh, gives us um, uh, essentially an opportunity for increased spectrum efficiency. But what it does is it really allows us to use more antennas to support multiple devices at the same time in the same band with the same, same uh, frequency resources. So you see four uh, different UEs or devices uh, lit up here and they're essentially now essentially being supported by the same platform. Um, we find that Massive MIMO is more extensible to TDD. Uh, because steering energy in the direction of a user is pretty efficient when we know where the user is coming from. And in TDD, we know um, pretty much where the user is coming from in FTD too, but um, the uplink and downlink frequencies may not be exactly matched and that creates some challenges. It also creates some challenges of signaling uh, perhaps uh, across the spectrum where the user is by making measurements on, on this sort of downlink. The array itself um, is dictated also by the frequency, the size of it. So if if we end up with a, a lower frequency, we end up with a much bigger array. So certain existing cellular frequencies today are not very extensible. And we'll see a picture of that in a minute. So don't worry if you didn't follow it now. Um, but basically you can imagine that actually going to a slightly higher frequency, not much higher, uh, but a mid-band frequency gives us an opportunity to integrate lots of antennas physically into a small form factor. And then of course we can exploit that by being able to create very narrow beams to serve a particular user. And this can lead to without very sophisticated schemes, a two to four X capacity gain by being able to serve um, two to four times as many users. Of course, that's just in the multi-user context. Of course, because we're beam forming, we also increase the reach of the antenna, essentially boost the SINR. And by boosting that SINR, then we effectively get um, a higher uh, spectrum efficiency. And just to highlight this, perhaps there's sort of three types of massive MIMO algorithms. So Pantelis and I worked together and wrote a paper maybe what, 18 years ago about something called grid of beams. Um, and, and that idea has been around for a long time. The simple idea is, is that you use fixed beams um, to serve users. And the idea of doing fixed beams has been around for a while. 
Um, the challenge, of course, is that fixed beams, you end up with not necessarily being optimal for every user location. It does re reduce complexity, uh, but we don't, we're not able to leverage sort of the full gain and the full performance that we'd be able to once we introduce something called zero forcing. And what, with zero forcing, what we do is we actually start putting nulls uh, where we don't want uh, to put energy. So we steer energy intelligently and we steer away from another user that we're trying to serve. So for this particular cartoon example, you can see this device is being steered to and these particular users are also being steered to. But if you pay attention very closely, you'll notice that typically there is a null place in the direction of where you're trying to serve the other user if you look at where the beams are serving. So if we look at the blue beam being served by this, we are throwing essentially trying to throw very little energy towards this guy. So that allows us to reuse spectrum in a very efficient and a very dynamic way. Of course, that does come with a cost of complexity. So what we've seen is that we're growing complexity in our base stations today. Uh, from relatively simple linear complexity in terms of how we design and choose beamforming to very, very high orders of complexity as we increase the, the kind of type of beamforming algorithm that we're using. Um, just beyond the horizon, uh, this is being deployed today. Uh, in the time scale of things, this was 2018, 2019 technology for 5G. This is 2020 to 2022 technology that we're sort of seeing with zero forcing. Um, what's coming just beyond the horizon in the 23 timeframe or so is something called uh, distributed massive MIMO. Some of you may have heard of the word network MIMO or network massive MIMO, but distributed massive MIMO essentially is joint transmission between cell sites. Um, and by doing such, this kind of thing, and that's what's shown here, we can significantly boost the individual spectrum efficiency, again, at a cost of complexity. And you have to do it very intelligently because if you're now using resources from one cell and using it to serve another cell, of course, we have a challenge or a problem of being able to support multiple cells at the same time. So going from grid of beams to distributed mass of MIMO does increase complexity, but you can see it's also clearly increasing the performance that we start to see. This is obtained really by increasing the amount of um, processing that we have in the base station. And these are typically done with um, system on a chip kind of platforms. Uh, we're doing a lot of work today on looking at other types of platforms for layer one, including GPUs. Um, and as we look forward to this, we expect that you know, more innovation will come. Um, since a lot of this innovation is directly in the radio, uh, there's a very conscious effort to focus on the power consumption of the box that sits on the top of the antenna. And again, we're going to see a picture of what that looks like in a minute um, so we can get a sense of where we're going. Um, Beamforming is important. Beamforming is complex. Uh, we can talk about sort of traditional techniques, but what we also introduce is now essentially is some form of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning for how we steer those beams. So what you see in the cartoon over here on the far right is people walking down a known path with a cell site sitting where, somewhere near this cell site, somewhere near the, those paths. And we find out that users tend to observe a rather fixed sort of pattern of movement across this. And you see a little car going across. What's shown here is essentially um, uh, optimization of instead of distributing my beams and my beam patterns in such a way that they're uniform in space, um, or in frequency, we find that there is a need to serve users with a certain type of clustering and design the beam patterns according to where the users are actually placed. So this essentially, this kind of optimization can almost be done in an offline fashion um, once you know where users are. And that type of thing has, is sort of now becoming a, a more important uh, part of our roadmap for as we introduce um, beam forming and massive MIMO capabilities in our roadmap to give the operators the capability to not have to spend time themselves as humans to do any of the interaction on the optimization, essentially removing humans from the equation because it's too complex. Um, believe it or not, uh, when I first started in this business, I actually went with a cell site installer from Sprint. I can make fun of Sprint because they don't exist anymore. Um, I don't know if anybody here works for Sprint, but um, I went with an installer to a cell site in Brooklyn, no less. Uh, and we were on a rooftop and we were looking down a street and he noticed that the antenna was pointed slightly askew from street side. And he was looking at, you know, he was being told that there were, there were his trouble tickets for this particular cell site. And he was trying to figure out where that trouble was coming from. He noticed that many of the people that were complaining were street side or in their cars. So what did he do? He just reached up, grabbed his wrench. And, you know, I would have thought he would have actually uh, loosened the bolts on the antennas. He just took the, his wrench and gave the antenna a good whack until it was nicely pointed street side. And, and that was it. You know, that was the machine learning and the human intelligence factor of doing cell site optimization. Of course, this was 18 years ago, but 
you know, the reality is, is that even today, there are many times when installers don't have a good idea where the traffic is, what's optimal in terms of how to place antennas, um, even from the data because of predictions and otherwise it isn't necessarily the optimal thing. So what we're finding is, is there's a lot of interest and then there's an opportunity for innovation specifically in this space of using user location to optimize how you do pattern optimization for massive MIMO. So now we sort of come back to sort of real experience. Um, so I give credit to my colleague, Hari Holma, uh, who's not here, he's sleeping, I hope, uh, in Finland, uh, but he is usually always awake and on. Um, my good friend Hari has decided to run around Finland um, and he is a uh, ultra class runner. He's very thin and runs a lot. He always takes his phone with him and he's always looking for 5G. So when he finds something, uh, he routinely uh, tweets it back to us and tells us what he sees in Finland where we've deployed with ELISA and you can see the 5G icon uh, probably displayed there, of course. What we see, of course, is that 5G does give us a pretty significant downlink boost in experience compared to what any of us are used to on our phones. I don't know what you guys have seen, but I haven't seen 1.3 gig on my phone. Um, and then, of course, on the upload sides, uh, you can significantly improve those as well. Uh, the particular first case doesn't have a particularly exciting upload, and this is a challenge with 5G in general is the uplink performance, but this is improving over time. The other thing, of course, that really changes dramatically is the latency experienced. So partially they benefit from the fact of how the network is deployed in Finland. Um, we're not talking about a big geographical area unlike the U.S. where um, core or application servers could be um, hundreds if not thousands of kilometers away from your cell site. In this particular case, you see that this ping time is six milliseconds. And that's pretty exciting, actually. I mean, some of us remember ping times uh, on in the 3G days being in the 70 to 100 millisecond time frame. To see this in the cycle of you know 18 years or so, um, actually, I can take that back. I remember on um, 3G1X, I remember seeing ping times on the order of uh, somewhere in the order of 200 to 500 milliseconds. Uh, now to see ping times on the order of six milliseconds is pretty pretty sexy. Um, so okay, this is why we do our work. You know to boost the data rates, to improve the latency, to give people an opportunity to push more data onto the network. That's that's kind of cool. Um, you know, so how do we do that? I kind of already kind of gave you this as an answer, but I'm just gonna reassert it just to, to be clear that everyone understands really what's different between LT and 5G. So going from LT to 5G, we introduce these mid-band frequencies or millimeter wave. Um, if we just focus on uh, the mid-band frequencies for a moment, which are coming rather rapidly in the US between this year and next year, um, T-Mobile, our, our customer, has actually deployed quite aggressively in something close to 3.6 at 2.6 gigahertz and aggressively deploying today to really provide a significant boost compared to what you would expect to see. Um, they will be able to deploy 120 megahertz at 2.6. So that will be quite different than what we're used to seeing. But 20 megahertz um, on a typical LTE network, uh, you might be able to see out of a single cell around 40 megabits per second. If you think about, you know, really what does this translate to on an individual user experience basis, I think it's it's pretty unusual to see more than 40, 50 megabits per second for a single user, uh, even with some sort of benchmarking testing. But we clearly saw it with 5G, you know, we're definitely able to leverage the additional bandwidth. Um, and then of course the additional higher spectrum efficiency due to beamforming algorithms to get up to like what we would call 10 bits per second per Hertz. So you can almost see the scaling. Um, you take hundred megahertz worth of bandwidth and then you multiply by 10, that would give you a gig because um, in those bands we use TDD as that means time division, time division duplexing. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with that as opposed to frequency division duplexing. That means both uplink and downlink share the same frequency, but they're slotted in time. That's TDD. FTD would be um, actually two independent frequencies, one for uplink and one for downlink. That gives you more reliability on the uplink, but it, it gets, comes at the cost of perhaps less overall spectrum efficiency. So significant boost by going from 4G to 5G by uh, these sort of key parameters. Um, I mentioned a little bit about the challenges of millimeter wave and I just kind of want to reiterate this. So the cell ranges that we've seen already from millimeter wave are nothing to write home for about. Um, uh, of course, there are uh, notable uh, exceptions. And you know, I just mentioned one particular environment that tends to lead to very uh, good exceptions. If you put your antenna and aim it down uh, a urban canyon, down a street side, um, sometimes we've seen them propagate for up to two or two and a half kilometers. But in um, typical sort of environments, especially as we move closer to the clutter on a lamppost, maybe we would see closer to 100 to 150 meters. If we go to the mid-band frequency, of course, we're compromised relative to what we've typically deployed cellular at today. So the 
the challenge for us today is that we will have to, in order to get that good 5G experience sort of nationwide, we will have to deploy more cells in the US um, because the cell density is really designed for sort of the legacy frequencies um, between 600 megahertz and 2.6 gigahertz, which provide very good coverage. I know many of you aren't happy with your coverage, but if you imagine that 3.5 gigahertz, you can see that it's clearly a factor of two or three worse compared to what we would typically see in the mid-band frequencies. I'm sorry, the mid-bands are two to three times worse than what we'd see in um, the existing legacy FTD frequencies. We know that there will be challenges potentially with coverage on 5G, which is okay. That means we'll hopefully sell more gear, uh, hopefully get paid more. Just a joke. But anyways, I think um, I did mention about the complexity of massive MIMO and what it really changes to in terms of a physical cell site. And this is actually quite a nice picture because it kind of shows you what it looks like to have massive MIMO compared to a traditional low band frequency. So what you see here, and I, I wish I had marked all of these for you, but this is a radio head. So this is where my power amplifiers and my low, low, low noise amplifiers are sitting. Um, so for both the uplink and downlink and my conditioning that takes my signal and turns it into a digital signal, that radio sits there. So you see a radio here, you see lots of cables connecting to a physical antenna. Um, so this is a cable mess. This is a cable mess. This is big. Um, this is a low band kind of deployment. You see something similar up here. Actually, Nokia has actually been pretty pioneering in being able to stack radio um, uh, radios together in like a cube. So they take multiple radios together and ultimately tie them together. So each one of these is probably a frequency uh, or set of frequencies. So they're stacked up together in a cube. So you see three of them together, three radio heads and then the antenna on top, and this is a multiband antenna, and you can see the snake of cables between them. Well, this is our massive MIMO antenna. One of the things that was sort of not appreciated by, by this engineer in particular, until I heard a customer talk about it, is that this is actually um, a lifesaver for these guys. So finally, when they look at massive MIMO, they say, oh, okay, I just only have to put one box on there, and I don't, can you imagine that these all have to be, most for the most part, connected while they're up there? So some poor guy is up there with a wrench. In this case, I, I hope he's not banging on anything because that's very expensive stuff that's up there. Um, but he's got to connect all those cables. Sometimes you can do some staging on the ground, but then finally, what if you have a problem and you have to troubleshoot it? This is not fun. So this does help you because if there's a problem, it's very simple. You take it down, you put a new one up. Um, in this case, the perception is, what do you do? Well, you don't want to take everything down so you have to try to figure it out. So in the end, um, you know, the, the hidden benefit of massive MIMO that none of us really anticipated is it's actually just about the insulation. No RF cables, just antenna power cable and fiber. The fiber is much easier to sort of get there. So I'll be honest with you, when I heard people talking about massive MIMO years ago, and I, I did my PhD dissertation work on array signal processing, and I first joined the cellular wireless business when we had two antennas per cell site, or two physical antennas, and now we're at 64. Uh, active antenna elements per, se per sector. So um, quite a significant increase in complexity in, in 20 years or so. But you know the, the thing that I didn't appreciate when I saw this difficulty of being able to build this, I never imagined that we get down to something this small and this integrated this quickly. It's not happening fast enough for most people to be honest, but at the same time, what we do see is that this is a big part of the story of 5G is that we will move to something that gives us an opportunity to deliver a gigabit kind of service. And gigabits kind of service can change the world when you think about it. So, you know, the, one of the challenges, of course, is that there's also the desire to want to show and light light bulbs and claim that you have wide area coverage. So what you'll see in the next few weeks, months between AT&T and Verizon together against T-Mobile is they will try to bring 5G into their existing bands, into their LTE bands. And this is enabled with something called dynamic spectrum sharing. And this is coming rather rapidly. So for people who think, oh, well, you know, 3.5 gigahertz auctions haven't taken place. I won't be able to see 5G on my phone unless I'm T-Mobile. Well, the good news is, or maybe the bad news, is that you will actually be able to see it on any phone, 5G phone, because uh, both all the operators in North America are actually now committed to rolling out um, 5G and legacy bands. And this is done with an intelligent technology that allows them to reuse the existing spans and spectrum. Traditionally, in the past, the way that we managed this was through something called refarming. That meant you turned off a G and you replaced it with, an, with the other G. So turn off 2G, replace it with 3G. 
turn off 3G, replace it with 4G. Well, it didn't really work that way. It turns out we turned off 3G before we uh, turned off 2G. But nonetheless, I think the bottom line is, is that this is now enabling us to do rapid rollout. Rapid is a theme that you'll hear from me because I think 5G is happening at a rapid pace and it's happening a bit faster than what we've seen before. Um, I think, you know, it usually is a bit of an arms race and we've seen T-Mobile quite active. Um, our, our good customer, they deployed it widely in 600 megahertz so that they could show nationwide coverage of, of 5G and their 600 megahertz band as an anchor band. So that means that it's always connected to a 5G um, core and to a 5G network. And now they're aggressively following this build out in 600 megahertz with a 2.6 gigahertz build out. So a, a lot of excitement overall in the US market of people building out, different operators building out 5G. So what's happening, sort of what's happening first? Well, I mentioned about the phase of sort of mobile broadband, and this is based on legacy 4G networks using existing sites and now starting to deploy 3.5 gigahertz around the world. Actually around the world, 3.5 happened before it happened in the US. So in Korea, um, in Japan, um, in Europe, largely 5G is being deployed in the 3.5 gigahertz band first. Um, this was a somewhat inactive band around the world. In the US, it happened to have a lot of restrictions around it. So it's a bit later and it will come later. Uh, as a result, the US has pivoted largely towards a millimeter wave first. So it's backwards compared to the rest of the world. Uh, the rest of the world is uh, now looking at millimeter wave as sort of its second phase introduced with now a new 5G core network also introduced with um, something we're gonna talk about a bit more, which is now the growth of something called Edge Cloud. And, and for, for, for folks here, for, I think you guys will appreciate this cloud piece. We'll get to that in a minute and why that's important because 5G is a lot about cloud. And so you'll see that also coming. So um, big boost in capacity, big boost in data rate. In phase two, there'll be a lot of focus on latency and you've probably seen some of the announcements about the tie-ups between Amazon and Verizon in particular. And I noticed there's some folks of former colleagues who are at Verizon. Uh, Verizon and, and Amazon have a pretty significant tie-up and it is all about latency. They're leveraging the Amazon Edge Cloud itself specifically to be able to drive to very low latency levels. Um, I think uh, ultimately what we're also expecting to see coming out of this is um, moving uh, processing even further and application servers to on-premise locations, in which case you can get extremely low latency, um, one to two milliseconds or sub five millisecond kind of latency, you saw six. So sub, sub six millisecond kind of latency and getting down to extremely high levels of reliability as well. Um, we talked about earlier that 4G was somewhere around the order of three, three nines. This is around five nines kind of reliability. This essentially allows you to replace a wire with a wireless connection. Um, without changing the application protocol. And this is a big focus of release 16 and release 17 activities for 5G. And this is more or less to be rolled out as a software upgrade on the base stations, but it will involve a fairly significant shift in how um, the back end of the network gets deployed from a core perspective. Why are they doing this? What's the driver for drawing towards extreme low latency? Well, um, partially it's because we're trying to look at trying to improve uh, public safety, can remote control or machinery to provide some type of guaranteed QoS. There's a concept introduced in 5G that's called network slicing. Uh, we can introduce a network slice for a particular operator or a particular need. Um, you'll notice, of course, I chose Elias as a use case here, mostly because I didn't want to bias my uh, talk too much towards one operator in the US versus the other. And I know that we have a number of different folks here and I don't wanna be accused of that. So sorry for the finish bias for those of you who don't know Elisa, but Elisa it was chosen in particular for that reason. But Elisa is actually doing something very similar to what operators in the US are doing as well, which is to provide essentially the capability to be the sole native radio network supplier for public safety, uh, and similar to at and but also working quite uh, seriously on providing slices in the network to uh, automate uh, factories, to automate machinery, and to automate control. Um, this is really the shift in the growth area of the cellular business. So previously we built out cellular networks where people were. Um, you would find out that we didn't build networks where people weren't. Uh, sometimes that creates problems for, for folks because you find large areas of people that suddenly weren't covered that get or get uncovered. Um, but now of course, the big shift and the big direction is towards building out networks and coverage for private wireless. These are dedicated local networks. So this is a, cho a chosen technology for a number of different applications over Wi-Fi simply because Cellular provides additional security, it provides additional resiliency and hardening that you just can't get from a Wi-Fi network. 
So um, dedicated local networks, private wireless is a big focal point um, these days. There's a lot of interest overall in moving forward on this. Um, whether it's for an airport or it's for a mine, uh, open pit mine, you can imagine the challenges with that for Wi-Fi is that the, the radius over which you need to communicate could be several kilometers. Wi-Fi just doesn't have the range to do that either at the frequency or for the technology itself. Um, private in a uh, airport is more about resiliency and capacity. Um, so the networks tend to handle larger numbers of users at a much better rate or better capability than what you'd typically get from Wi-Fi. So I mentioned about rush and, and rushing. So one of the things that you know, sort of is important, and I think you know, especially for students, I think about a lot, it's like, well, where is the world going to be? I sometimes think of myself sitting um, at my desk some 25, 30 years ago. I can't believe I'm that old. Um, but so many years ago, uh, sitting and thinking about where, where is the world going? The cellular business was booming um, when I um, graduated, this was 98, not that long ago, I guess, 22 years ago. Um, but uh, one of the things that was quite interesting is just the pace of innovation in cellular was pretty slow. Um, we were about 10 years per generation. The interesting thing in watching sort of the penetration rates in particular on 5G um, is just to notice that we're seeing that 5G penetration rates are expected to, and, and are tracking against um, subscribers as well as technology at a much rapid, more rapid rate. So the first LTE iPhone um, came in 2012, uh, which, you know, we had first commercial networks for LTE launched in the U.S. in 2009, so about three years later, um, versus we launched commercial service for 5G in 2019, um, practically, and we have the first iPhone with 5G in 2020, so only a year later. Um, we're seeing 50% penetration rates plan for, especially in Korea, is expected, I think, sometime next year. Uh, so this is driving sort of the overall shift in direction. We're almost on a two-year accelerated pace um, uh, compared to what we've normally seen uh, on other generations. 3G was actually slow and, and actually staged twice. We had uh, wideband CDMA released 99, and then we had um, uh, HSTPA that came about five years later, six years later. So 3G actually came in two pieces. Um, but with uh, with LTE, for the most part, it came in or around 2010, 11, but relatively slower uptake because of the the build out and the costs and the structures of the companies that were deploying it um, for 3G or sorry for 4G. But now we see an acceleration, a lot of acceleration. So that's starting to generate already interest in what's next. What happens after 5G? Is it 6G? Um, but also the question is is how do you do 5G at scale? Um, and what's happened sort of to the ecosystem of suppliers and all. And so I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about openness um, after I just sort of, uh, yeah, I'm going to skip that slide. Nothing too exciting. It just sort of tells you about something about uh, Korea usage for data, and it kind of brings some a bit more of the points of specifically what people are using it for uh, 5G today. Uh, because at the moment, Korea is sort of leading the world in terms of the usage of 5G. A uh, lot, lot of interest in virtual reality and, and of course, watching videos. Um, seems to be a culture where folks really like to watch live streams of concerts, especially now due to COVID. Um, this is happening a lot, and gaming is important. But overall, the, the overall push towards 5G has been pretty quick in, in Korea. So I was going to shift gears a bit and talk about openness. So um, a lot of operators want to deploy 5G, especially the uh, operators who have uh, limited access to spectrum or will have limited access to cell sites. So this drives a whole shift in paradigms. I, I guess when, when Patelis and I started in this business, there were 16 healthy infrastructure providers, maybe 25 healthy um, handset providers. Today, there are roughly three healthy um, infrastructure providers, and, and geopolitics is driving a little bit of that um, as to which three are sort of in trouble at any given moment or in sort of not in trouble. But um, there are only three infrastructure providers, domain one, tier one, kind of that. And on the handset side, on the chipset side, there's really only um, three dominant suppliers of chipsets for handsets, three. Um, so going from you know, you know, high numbers of teens down to basically three. And, and some people would argue the rule of three is at play, but maybe the reality is, is that the challenge is, is that getting to scale um, in uh, markets which are proprietary and bespoke uh, makes it very difficult to be successful. Um, it doesn't mean that you, you can see 5G adoption is happening fairly quickly, but for widespread adoption, for it to become scalable for industrials, a lot of discussion about can we be more open? Can we leverage from the IT world 
um, more in the virtualization space. So you kind of look at you know what has happened now. You know we really had two global forces that created what we call the mobile internet today or mobile broadband experience. You had coming from sort of the telco world a variety of things that were sort of useful or meaningful. Um, now merging together with all the tools that comes to, from the web scale and the IT world. And then there's a timeline here and I'm, I'm not going to go through it. I think that you can kind of sense, get a sense of it. Um, many of the companies that I have been involved with and I've never really uh, left where I've been. Um, I was, I started at Lucent, Lucent got acquired by Alcatel, became Alcatel, Lucent, of course, Alcatel, Lucent became Nokia. If I look at the heritage of the companies of Lucent, um, Alcatel, Alcatel, Lucent and Nokia, Many are involved in very different ways of contributing to this open ecosystem on the telco side um, and to some degree, to a lesser degree on the web scale on the IT side. Definitely more of a telco heritage um, for these companies. But then, of course, as we see, as these platforms become more computer oriented, um, there is definitely a movement towards uh, the web scale world. So what does that mean, finally? Um, you know, we, we've been, had a lot of discussions about how can we make our world of RAN Telecom more um, open and essentially allow for a broader ecosystem um, to leverage actually even open source tools in the development. When you have um, three uh, sort of dominant folks in the business, it also creates challenges with respect to tooling. Many of us don't have the expertise or the capability to build the tools that are needed for cloud, optimization, cloud optimization. So we have to leverage open source. So it's needed, nobody's going to take our tools either if we had our own specific uh, proprietary tools uh, for doing that in many cases, um, although we do offer that capability often. So in the end, we find that there's a need to sort of toe the balance between what was historically in the cellular business, very integrated, very closed, to now essentially being very open and essentially allowing for a less integration. Um, less integration gives op op opportunities now for other um, types of companies to surface as integrators. Um, and provide that kind of value added service potentially. Of course, with the complexities that we see in the network, it actually becomes difficult to do such a thing like that. So maybe we break it down a little bit further and look at, you know, in a mobile network and, okay, so you saw a device and inside of a radio access network, we have a radio unit, we have something we're now calling a distributed unit, um, something called a centralized unit. So traditionally this was a single box, um, a single box that we called baseband. Um, when I first started in this business, these were all integrated into a single box. The radio, um, the distributed unit, or the baseband, as well as controllers were all sitting in one physical box. Um, we pulled the radio unit outside of the box so we could put it on top of the tower. Uh, then, of course, now we've broken the baseband into pieces and we centralized some of it and put that into a server, a cloud-based server, which is close to the core. It also allows us an opportunity to do local breakout for applications. Well. 3GPP saw this coming and started to create essentially open interfaces between these boxes um, that allow for that. Now, it didn't provide the complete recipe on how to make openness work. Openness is a challenge. You need plug fest, you need integration, you need uh, interworking between vendors. And so ORAN is now trying to do that and writing a set of essential specs that will do that. So we now have something called ORAN, which stands for Open RAN. Um, this is an operator-led forum that really sort of is trying to ensure now that all of these different devices can work together and be deployed in the network. Um, it was launched in June of 2018. It's uh, together, it's actually aligned with TIP. Um, it's not very far from the open, um, from Linux Foundation and open source, force forum, <clears throat> open source forums. So in the end, there's contributions from the teams, but the operators were really looking at how do they make their IT network and their telco network sort of converge. Um, they wanted to follow some of the same kinds of things that were happening in the IT world with white boxes and drive TCO uh, down further so that they could deploy networks at scale. You probably remember I, I told you that in order to deploy 5G effectively, we had to do more physical cell sites, uh, whether it was millimeter wave or mid-band. The consequence of that is while they run their legacy networks and they add additional cell sites, they don't necessarily increase the revenue that they get per subscriber. So they're looking for opportunities to try to reduce the total cost of the network. And this is now being sponsored under this broad umbrella of ORAN, which also allows for open standards, um, open interfaces, APIs, even open source to some degree. Um, I won't say it's widely sort of accepted by the domain vendors, but the startups do benefit a lot from being able to get to uh, a set of open source for the telecom RAN itself. So I kind of just want to reiterate the point. You know, before in a traditional RAN, we had radios 
and baseband in a single box. Um, but we also have them all delivered by a single vendor, including the management plane. So the management of the network was managed by a single vendor. This, of course, is evolving um, with ORAN we sort of and moved to open interfaces. With 3GPP, we start to split things apart and we introduce something called a, a RAN intelligent controller, which essentially is an entry point that helps us control the rest of the network. When we move further and we virtualize, we say, okay, now we'll put all of these platforms on virtualized platforms. Now we can't virtualize the radio. Um, radio is still very difficult to virtualize, but the baseband, the layer one software, the layer two software, as well as the controller software can live specifically on a platform which can be virtualized. And then you can run that typically with your OpenStack or Kubernetes based tools. And there are a variety of companies now that have surfaced that now are providing tooling support. And some operators are even building their own uh, platforms specifically to do cloud-based management of their platforms. And, and so that's what's coming now. So virtualization will essentially now allow operators to also separate hardware and software. This allows for entrants to focus on hardware only, radio only, or software only, and make that their core expertise. Admittedly, um, because of the size and scale of the domain vendors, the startups are competing with um, uh, very large companies. But over time, we expect that this model will start to proliferate. And this will essentially allow for a lot more vendor diversity for operators, but also perhaps more rapid innovation. And that's what the real hope is, is that we actually see um, sort of fueling this pace of need to support higher data rates, a different user experience, and connect more machines with a wireless connection, that this will drive this. So I'm going to skip this slide. This gives you a bit of this discussion on what ORAN is. I did want to spend just a minute to talk about this sort of new level of control that gets introduced with ORAN. So normally what happens is we have control of the network either directly in um, the at access points themselves, and these are called enode Bs or genode Bs, um, or we have the orchestration, the automation, and the management taking place in the OSS, classical OSS layer. But the problem with being real-time is that you're limited in terms of what you can stack here and what you can do because you run out of compute. This is heavily cost-optimized, you heard. It's also physically optimized in terms of power and other, um, and performance that we need to be able to support uh, a lot of complexity with respect to bandwidth or the physical number of antennas or beamforming algorithms that you heard about um, and imagine the associated data that goes through this box difficult to stick more control here so the idea of something called the RAN intelligent controller was born and this platform essentially allows uh, some of the functionality that would normally fit in enode b and geno b to be more effectively managed um, in something called this RAN intelligent controller and this platform is very open um, the platform itself, uh, we were actually engaged in a, an effort, co-creation effort with AT&T where the platform is open sourced. Um, there are actually two competing open source platforms, one coming from the optics side, growing out of the SDN controller side, and another coming specifically out of the co-creation work that Nokia has been doing with AT&T. So two open source platforms have already surfaced. Um, in addition, the platforms have a uniform API environment, uh, so you can run X apps. These X apps then can do things like uh, handover optimization, some form of advanced SON, load balancing, and control and arbitrate network slices, which are important when you have to deploy a complex network that supports a lot of different types of subscribers. So, so I think um, the RAN Intelligent Controller gives us that opportunity to do so. <clears throat> so, Pentelis, I just realized that we didn't really announce, usually I do at the beginning, the, the question and answer policy. So I did not um, plan to take questions until about 7.30, but I, or till I get to the question and answer slide at the end. But mm -hmm. I'm also okay to take uh, questions from folks um, now uh, or in the middle. So I don't know what the protocol is. Should we no, wait? There's no, there's no uh, strict protocol. Also, people can start typing questions on the chat if they feel that they do not want to interrupt, if they want to, which is not really an interruption. It's just we try to make it a bit more live uh, than uh, basically having a, uh, Rob only, only presenting until a certain time. Uh, yes. so if you can, I can easily talk for hours, that's right, yeah. without, without pausing nonetheless. But yeah, for sure, there, there, if you guys have a question, um, I guess you can either put it in the chat window and, mm -hmm. and, and then I guess, Pintelis, I guess I'll see a notification if something surfaces there in the, in the chat window. Yeah. But yeah, you can also raise a hand and go on camera. I don't know if I can see every camera. But uh, Pentelis, if you see somebody come on camera with a raised hand, just let me know. Okay. So are there, maybe I'll just pause for a second and see if anybody has any questions. Yeah, there is one question. 
Uh, what edge does uh, Nokia have against its competitors in regards to 5G market delivery? It's a, it's a good question. I think, um, you know, Nokia is a, um, so first of all, I don't want to make this a Nokia commercial. Um, this is really about your learning and about understanding what 5G is. But um, one of the things that we tend to point to at least is that Nokia is an end-to-end -end company um, in networking. So that means that uh, we develop gear for uh, transport, for routing, for switching, um, for management systems, uh, as well as the radio access network, as well as the core. And that core can decompose into two pieces. We typically they call that um, the IMS core as well as the packet core. The packet core tends to be more about anchoring calls and about data sessions. Um, the IMS core is, is probably um, best thought of as anchoring voice and voice connections and voice connectivity, but uh, anything else? <clears throat> There's another question from Philip. Uh, where physically would be the uh, RIC or the RIC controller uh, be located in the network and can it be distributed? Phil, good to see your face. Good to see you. Uh, been a while. I hope you're doing well. Um, uh, Phil and I were office mates many years ago and of course, good friend. But uh, the RIC is um, typically imagined today to be located in something called um, the edge uh, of the network or edge cloud. So um, that typically is on the order of 500 to 1,000 kilometers away. Um, you can have a multi-instance RIC in your network, just like you could have a distributed core. So you could have multiple RICs covering multiple geographic regions of the country, for example. Um, then um, you can imagine, of course, that uh, the RIC can even be deployed at the extreme edge in an on-premise location. Uh, but I think the normal place to expect it is to be in what's called the edge or even far edge. Far edge is maybe even too much of an extreme for it. Okay. I see another question from Charles Sebola. How many other companies are subcontractors in this 5G program? I think the question is about ORAN, how many companies are involved um, specifically in um, ORAN itself. So ORAN has around 140 contributors. I think this chart may already be out of date. Um, there are 24 principal operators that are deeply involved and even that may be somewhat out of date. Um, more operators have joined, I think, recently. Um, but uh, yeah, if you take out roughly 30 operators and assume around 150 uh, overall contributors, that means 120 companies are involved that make gear or software or are some type of integrator. There are a number of integrators that have surfaced that will support test integration, either at the system level, or subsystem level, or overall solution level, and they are also involved in ORAM. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So why are we doing this? Why are we moving to virtualized RAN? Um, what is sort of the underlying motivation? So you know, this picture here, um, for those who are in this business, they see this picture and it has an immediate pattern recognition to them. It's a baseband unit. It's baseband hardware that goes at the base of a cell site that unless you've gone to a cell site, you probably never see, and not in the wireless business, you've probably never seen one. But this is a typical, and it's funny, you could replace one from one vendor with another vendor. They all look very, very similar. Essentially a 2U or 3U rack that has lots of modems and controller cards that plug into it. Sometimes it's a single 1U rack, but they stack them together in a, in a single form factor to be able to realize the capacity that's needed to support a cell site. This is a bare metal platform, typically with purpose-built ASICs, designed custom for each individual um, solution that's de defined. And this is what we often call classical RAN. What's happening with now with VRAN, and sometimes we call it VRAN2, is we virtualize um, the DU, that's the layer one, and our real-time layer two, as well as control in the CU itself. And these can be deployed in a central location or centralized location or somewhere else. ORAN, what it has done is essentially opened the horizontal interfaces or created horizontal openness. VRAN is creating now essentially a vertical openness. VRAN actually precedes ORAN. So um, there are a number of virtualized RAN uh, companies that exist out there that are direct competitors of ours um, that started well before the 2018 timeframe. Altiostar is notable. Um, I think somewhere in the 2010 timeframe, they, they launched uh, in, I believe, um, Avenir, which just announced their IPO a couple weeks ago or a week ago. Um, they actually have a very complex heritage um, that spans into 2001, 2002. Granted, they started in the core and crept out and then, of course, acquired a company which is very focused on uh, virtualized RAN itself. 
But the applications themselves of virtualizing the DU or the baseband itself and placing it on cloud platforms existed before ORAN did. What ORAN is now starting to do and specifies the recipes and the configurations for how OpenStack should work, how Kubernetes should interface with the network, and then what the physical hardware should look like. When you take and you move from uh, very, very specialized hardware with purpose-built ASICs with accelerators and you move into a data center application, you can potentially lose performance. The initial solution to this is FPGAs for acceleration, uh, but now we're moving into a space where certain types of ASICs may be reintroduced in the network, uh, really focused on providing some form of acceleration in the network. But VRAN sort of creates what we call vertical openness versus ORAN creating horizontal openness. So they're somewhat complementary and also somewhat separable. You could do VRAN uh, without ORAN and you can do ORAN without VRAN. Um, because ORAN is really just implying about open interfaces, although it's also providing a recipe for how to deploy VRAN. The true sort of ORAN compliant VRAN solutions, I think, will come in a year or two. They're probably not happening immediately. So, you know, just to give you a sense of what we, Nokia, have been doing with virtualized RAM so far, I think actually just to announce and basically make you aware of the fact that we today actually have our um, centralized unit now, Cloudified, and running on bare, on a sort of uh, data center servers, communicating to gear which is deployed at the cell site, which is not virtualized. And it just has the layer one, layer two function and the radio function at it. Um, we start to move into a space where we're gonna move the DUs and the CUs into data centers. In um, some cases, we'll even do virtualization at the cell sites uh, with some of our customers uh, to be able to do that. We're now looking actually at doing, uh, I mentioned about accelerators using uh, ASICs uh, potentially for acceleration. A project which is part of our stream of activities within my team is actually to look at GPUs for layer one acceleration. So there is, uh, again, you know, a lot of opportunity to, to do things with um, GPUs for acceleration. Um, you could use the GPU for other applications, not just for telecom, but the GPUs themselves then become useful for doing layer one function. And for those of you who are very familiar with signal processing, you know that a GPU is actually somewhat optimal for doing signal processing applications and for managing AI and ML workflows. Well, it turns out also to be pretty good for doing layer one telecom, including channel estimation, including ironically even LDPC encoding and decoding. So that can actually do better than a pure CPU based instance, uh, much like a, um, how GPUs have taken over some of the other CPU workflows, um, in, either in data centers or even in your handsets. Um, we have GPUs in our handsets today to do graphics renderings and, and otherwise, and that's largely a signal processing kind of application. So why is there a need to sort of start to disaggregate the network and separate it? Well, it's really driven finally by latency. So if we imagine a classical cell site where the baseband is deployed, and I'm missing an image, it seems to have gone away. Um, if my baseband was deployed at the cell site and I was to deploy a, um, application server in a central cloud location, I would end up with uh, round trip times for latency in the order of 10 to 50 milliseconds. When I'm trying to do two things actually with VRAN, one is to take advantage of what happens when I centralize. So when I centralize and I can start to pool my hardware and pool across different boundaries of hardware itself and pl place it in a more flexible place. When at the same time that I'm pulling things away from the cell site and gaining in terms of uh, cost benefit, I'm also bringing the application servers in uh, inward. Now, in a country like Finland, it doesn't matter because I'm not a thousand kilometers away from the cell site. But in the U.S., what will get what will happen is we'll start to see um, the core as well as the CUs start to drift towards the edge of the cell. Sorry, towards the edge of the network, and that will give us an advantage in terms of pure latency. So the advantage that we start to get finally by going to virtualized hardware implicitly, not, not directly, is that we enable an architecture that allows us to flexibly deploy the radio access network where it needs to be deployed as opposed to two big monoliths, one at the cell site and one some common centralized cloud. We start to move things away from the cell site. And we also start to move the applications away from public cloud or centralized location. This gives us an advantage in latency. And you can see this sort of graphically played out that if you did it in a uh, regional location, you'd have a 10 to 20 millisecond latency. If you're in uh, sort of the sweet spot of being around 20 kilometers, 20 kilometers or so away from the cell site, you can get sub one millisecond latencies uh, with 5G, which actually you couldn't do um, with LTE. Uh, there were changes that actually had to be made to the physical interface itself in order to unlock 
this latency itself. And so you can get to very low latencies. Once you have very low latencies, then you can imagine applications like haptics and surveillance, um, command and control or robotics actually now working quite effectively in a local application server. So that's really the advantage, the hidden advantage of moving to a virtualized RAN. Now you can do a lot of this with bare metal, but then of course you're now moving physical bare metal from one place to another. It's purpose-built, it's specific. In this case, we end up with a uniform architecture of servers which are deployable in any location. And that's sort of a desirable thing from an operator perspective. They like to be able to deploy their, their, their servers in a distributed cloud environment as opposed to worrying about where their physical appliances are in the network. So what drives this latency uh, sort of discussion and what types of applications are important? We often use the word URLCC, and I talked about this before. Uh, URLCC is essentially um, ultra-reliable and low-latency communication. Um, there are certain applications that really require low-latency. Interesting um, that electricity distribution, there's a lot of desire to monitor uh, for outage and take actions uh, in this particular application. So being having low latency becomes important, for example, to cut out a circuit connection when you detect that something is broken. Um, this is important. And it, usually a, a cable falling or failing happens on a millisecond scale. Uh, you don't have several hundred milliseconds to react before damage can occur uh, to the network or to people. So by being able to detect that and do that reliably has driven them to a desire to have essentially sub five millisecond latency. Drones are an interesting thing because we fly drones today without extremely resilient networks. Um, so in some cases, depending upon how the drone application is working and what level of control and how quote smart the drone is and how autonomous it is, uh, drives you into different space in terms of requirements on latency. But drones can also require relatively low latency. Um, for something called V2X or V2V, um, if you're doing coordination of uh, convoys for, for traffic, then of course there's a desire to have very low latency. If you're just trying to communicate signals to cars that are communicating to each other or give them traffic notices, you don't necessarily need such low latency. But if you're trying to communicate or have autonomous driving or essentially have cars piggybacking and packed together as closely as possible, then you want to have extremely low latency. Um, the traditional applications, the consumer applications for mobile broadband don't generally require such low latency, although there's a lot of discussion in particular about whether specific types of AR and VR might drive you again towards very low latency kinds of use cases. Okay. Um, in, you know, today, I think we're starting to look at you know, where you can do this. And of course, I mentioned that to unlock that very low latency, you need to be able to have um, build out something we call the far edge itself. And that's enabled with um, in sort of three classes. And I mentioned electricity in particular before. Uh, robotic control is also another area of interest or, or of, of overall um, visibility for wanting to support um, low latency, but also reliable communication. And then uh, talked a little bit about automated driving. So this is happening real. Um, this will happen between now and the next G. We'll start to see these things surface as applications enabled by densely built 5G networks. Okay. So just to get to the end of this on the discussion on sort of openness and, and so you heard that this real driver for openness was about uh, building an ecosystem. It was about uh, creating opportunities to separate hardware from software, possibly leading to higher levels of innovation. Um, the secret, of course, is that by going to a distributed kind of implementation, um, which you can do to technically without an open framework, but the open framework allows us to move faster. Uh, it will also unlock the ability to support low latency applications. Um, it's not the only recipe for how you do this, but it is at least a clear roadmap to how do you get to low latency in the network. So um, with uh, ORAN, what we've essentially done is essentially unblocked or unlocked and had uh, operators be able to choose between radio vendors and baseband vendors, hardware vendors and software vendors, but also introduce new forms of intelligent control of the network with the RAN intelligent controller. So the opportunities are significant um, on the radio side, and we see lots of announcements from our direct competitors on low cost, low complexity radios, but also with VRAM, a lot of interest in what can you do. There's a lot of sort of fragmentation in the industry at the moment on the platform management strategy, um, alignment on accelerator definitions themselves. And then of course, how do you manage across portability of code across different platforms? Um, as much as we like to say that uh, code is cloud agnostic, it's gonna take a while for the cloud, uh, um, sort of the telecom applications to evolve into uh, applications which are truly cloud agnostic, which is why I told you that I'm, I'm looking to hire interns who, are, who have cloud, strong cloud backgrounds, not necessarily those who have strong telecom backgrounds. 
Um, the telecom part is, well, for us, it's hard, but that's it. You have a question, Pentelis. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, if you can answer it. Is there any effort to deploy RIC X apps at a wavelength region in New York City urban area? I feel like I should know the answer to that question, that, that actually there is a very active collaboration. There are sets of collaborations uh, on the RIC itself. I, 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 you're probably, you, you may even remember it better from your days in Nokia, whether how far we had progressed on this, but there was definitely discussion on this one in particular. Okay. There's, it's an active discussion. In fact, one of the things that I know that there was even, oh, there we go, we got the answer. P-I-Z from Shri. So I, I didn't want to speak out of turn, but yeah, in fact, it's actually running right now. Okay. But I, Wavelength is AWS. Yeah, yeah, Wavelength is AWS. And uh, when I went, when I since I'm using AWS kind of uh, very regularly, uh, definitely now there's an option to select the region and uh, select, if you like, the wave one of the wavelength regions. And so I was wondering if anyone has actually deployed in the wavelength regions, uh, you know, more kind of telecom workloads as this was why they were created in the first place. Yeah, in fact, um, the, and Shri would know better because I know he's in the middle of that trial, but my understanding is, um, yeah, and, the, and I think this is actually a good place to for interaction point between with the Cosmo team itself. It's, it's, it's a good good just good suggestion, Phil, as well that that there is um, an opportunity perhaps to do some innovative things with researchers in the area on RIC use cases since there's a lot of interest in that. But um, it, the RIC is an open platform, and, and that's one of the reasons that we tried to do that. We we're encouraging from my group in particular openness with a variety of different sources uh, to bring in X apps. Obviously, Nokia wants to make money selling X apps, so the priority is around developing those X apps and seeing them get to market. But we do have an experimental platform that we can play with, and, and we're looking at using that with a couple of different operators right now. So if you want, we can have more discussion about that afterwards. Um, I don't believe that they've done anything other than very simple experiments of trying to run the RIC on AWS. I don't believe it has actually uh, successfully been run sort of open loop, meaning without somebody there managing it uh, on, on an AWS cloud. But that's actually a very interesting use case. OK. I'll confirm that and get back to you. Thank you. OK. Any other questions? All right. So um, I started to give my summary without giving it. But yeah, I mentioned, of course, RAN cloudification is a big opportunity that gets unlocked with ORAN and VRAN. Um, and of course, that allows us now to have zero footprint at the site itself and put the compute where the compute is needed uh, to support the application servers to drive, finally, latency. Um, this also allows us to slice out the network. So depending upon what kind of service you need, you essentially get a virtual slice, a logical slice of the network that supports you and can be managed and totally isolated, um, which is a key thing for a number of different types of customers that are very interested or enterprises want to separate out their data. They don't want their data pooled or mixing with anybody else's data. This, this has become a very important thing for a number of different types of enterprises, um, not even just government ones. Um, I highlighted specifically the desire to move to something which is sort of uh, de decompose itself, and then the RIC itself is providing some opportunity to do um, some form of, you can almost think of it as fast SON, but it also does policy management and UE grouping. I mentioned that I was looking for cloud provider knowledge. Yes, and I will I will make sure that Pentelis has uh, information on how you can apply. Okay, and then finally, the last part of it is, of course, the management and the automation piece. And yeah, we're looking to try to make this as simple as possible. As we introduce disaggregation, we introduce complexity. Um, this is now no longer in sort of the span and control of a single network operation center. Uh, you need to automate your operations. You need to have essentially some ability to have limited touch into the network. Um, I even highlighted perhaps earlier the physical change of moving to massive MIMO, how it simplifies the deployment of antennas, radios, um, connectors uh, at the physical cell site. So everything is now designed around trying to ultimately make the cellular network much more operational. So what's next? Okay, so we talked about what we're seeing today in the network. We're talking about ORAN and VRAN. So what's, what's coming sort of next? What are the next big things in wireless perhaps that we can talk about? Um, so I mentioned a little bit about release 16 and 17. So there's gonna be a lot of focus on turning wires. What is, I have a question. What is the timeline for application of millimeter use? So I think the question is, is are 
Um, are we seeing millimeter wave uh, deployments today in the network? The answer is yes. So the iPhone 12, which launched uh, a couple weeks ago, has millimeter wave in it. The Samsung Galaxy latest version also has millimeter wave cellular uh, bands in it. So uh, Verizon is the one that is the most aggressive in the US. Um, AT&T will follow. Uh, probably a lot depends on how successful Verizon is in deploying millimeter wave. Uh, it's also coming um, significantly now in Japan. So in wave two of the 5G deployment in Japan, which will be next year, uh, we'll see large scale deployments of millimeter wave in Japan, Korea following about uh, roughly around the same time. Um, China will be about a year or so later. So millimeter wave comes with the challenges, but also there's lots of opportunities and there are a number of companies, operators around the world that are looking to it. It will be slower in Europe. Uh, it'll be slower in Africa and in South Asia, but uh, I just sort of the forward leaning countries themselves that will drive it. I just mentioned the US, uh, Japan, Korea, and China. And roughly we've, we're on that time scale of millimeter waves deployed now in the US, next year in Japan, next year Korea, or late next year Korea, and then the following year in China. Okay. So what I started to say was we, we kind of already covered really 16 and 17 and what that's changing for us. We have a wide market reach with a variety of devices in release 15 now, um, but there's more coming. I think the real focus is, is on growing network and network capability to support machines, to support control, um, growing out into the enterprise market itself, um, creating essentially new opportunities for operators and for vendors alike to sell their gear to different use cases. So that's the focus of really 16 and 17 that's coming right now, essentially millions and millions of devices that don't necessarily involve humans. Um, but then, you know, finally, what are we investing in? What are we researching right now? Uh, we want to be able to improve the radio itself. So we go beyond the platforms of today. We, we gave you a bit of a highlight on moving towards distributed massive MIMO. So very efficient use of radio, very good beam forming algorithms requiring lots of computing complexity. A lot of it potentially now being offloaded into the cloud while some of it still remains there local at the cell site. Um, a very flexible network architecture. I've kind of alluded to it a little bit. I didn't spell any quote Nokia secret sauce on how we're sort of planning for this with the evolution of VRAN, but very flexible deployment networks for new business models and new architectures that allow operators to have essentially not think of it as um, dozens of MVNOs on their network, but hundreds if not thousands of MVNOs on their network. Um, I don't know if you guys know this terminology, mobile vendor, uh, virtual network operator. So MNOs are mobile network operator. Um, this is typically a Verizon and AT&T uh, T-Mobile, but then there are also these things that are called MVNOs. Um, Boost was one that you remember or might remember. Metro PCS became an MVNO after it was acquired by T-Mobile. Um, that means that they don't actually have any physical premises, just a brand. Um, they were very popular in the US, um, still somewhat around, but largely what seems to happen is they, yeah, Spectrum is another one. Um, they seem to sort of disappear uh, or get acquired. So those low cost consumers seem to ultimately get acquired by the large domain operators. And I saw that track phone was acquired by um, Verizon just a couple of weeks ago. So. Again, you know, on the consumer side, the need to have all these small-ish networks that are really about branding and wholesaling off the network is becoming less important, but what's becoming important is essentially to create a network slice that is ultimately useful for um, an enterprise to have their own service. So you may see Walmart have its own network slice on um, a piggyback on an existing network. And of course, this is Dish's business model. So Dish Networks, which is not launched yet, um, is really trying to make themselves out as the wholesaler of network services and will not intend to even have their own branded service even though they acquired Boost. So they will essentially have um, uh, be a network of, of virtual operators that run on top of them. They will build the infrastructure and they intend to build it out as infrastructure as a service. Um, that's their model. And so we are trying to envision that there may be other operators around the world and lots of people are studying them and studying uh, vendors or operators like Reliance and Rakuten in Japan, where the sort of hyper flexible business model where you wholesale your network and provide it for others may become the new business model for how cellular networks get deployed. Um, of course, I mentioned a little bit about intelligent, artificial intelligence and machine learning and how important it is. Of course, as we increase density in cell sites, um, this consumes more energy. So there's a lot of focus on what we can do to further optimize uh, energy efficiency. 
um, and reduce uh, carbon footprints for networks around the world. Um, so there's a lot of energy and emphasis specifically being spent on that. Um, if we just talk a little bit about the radio side, uh, I think there is really a, an emphasis on massive MIMO in particular, uh, different types of algorithms themselves, essentially boosting sector throughput, tighter integration between millimeter wave I mentioned before with sub six gigahertz, then of course tying all the bands together in some sort of uniform experience. That's something called carrier aggregation. Um, it's a very really low tech kind of idea, but making it work is actually very complex, especially across different bands, uh, across millimeter wave and sub six gigahertz becomes really challenging. And, and that's what we expect to see driving people towards very high combined peak rates. So it seems that the more that we give uh, data rates out to consumers, the more that they take. So that's been proven out more or less now in Korea that having access to uh, much higher bandwidths with much lower latency led to higher consumption of data, which I guess sort of proves out and validates to some degree that bigger in is better, faster is better. So that, that does validate that. Um, for the hyper-flexible network, I think it's all linked together into a few pieces itself. So CloudRan architecture becomes critical uh, in how we deploy networks themselves and lots of opportunities for CS and IT folks now to work in the sort of RAN telecom world. In fact, we expect that the hyperscalers will start to dominate this sector of telecom fairly soon. They already are to a large degree, but will exert even more dominance in the control of how Radio access, radio access networks get deployed. Physical cell sites may not be in their cards. Uh, it is a very much a brick and mortar kind of business, but finally there is opportunity. And then of course, ORAN unlocks a lot of this uh, together. Um, I mentioned about network slicing and about the DISH model, essentially being able to isolate business services and dynamically evolve is an important consideration with respect to that. We talked a little bit about edge computing and edge control uh, driving towards low latency. Um, I think you know there's an, a, a, a consortia called Industry 4.0, which is examining the potential for linking network slicing and edge computing together to provide remote control services in a meaningful way for operators to now deploy networks. Some enterprises may choose to deploy their own networks, so totally independent of the operators, but many of them will reach out to the operators themselves specifically for help in deployment. Another exciting thing that's coming, of course, is that non-terrestrial networks are resurfacing again. Um, this is a big focus of release 17. Some of us have seen this movie before and we wonder if the outcomes will be different. We remember Global Star, we remember Iridium, remember significant crashes and burns in the past. Um, different set of players, although we saw a fairly uh, similar outcome with OneWeb and um, their failure, I think, uh, or bankruptcy. Um, I hope nobody here works for OneWeb, but uh, uh, I think the bottom line is, is that it remains to be seen. I think we are actively watching the sector um, in Nokia and trying to figure out how we should participate. We're driving IP and standards for being able to deploy essentially um, a single terminal that will do 5G for terrestrial networks as well as for satellite networks. So you won't have a separate satellite phone and a separate terrestrial phone. You'll have just a single phone integrated in a single solution, possibly with a lot of commonality on the back end, on the core side, on billing and otherwise. That's the dream. Um, Many satellite networks have already launched um, and they are not relying on sort of 3GPP standards. It'll be interesting to watch as 3GPP standards become available. Do we converge um, between those solutions and what's already deployed or will they remain, remain uh, proprietary sort of single bespoke systems? Um, exciting technology for guys who spend most of their time on the ground. Uh, we, we do work with a number of different folks that were interested in this. The real exciting thing is um, is that you know you now can provide coverage to all various points around the world, um, and and this I think is is a pretty exciting thing for uh, to be able to see that. And and as Phil has pointed out, we're now putting cellular coverage on the moon. Um, this is a this is truly a research innovation project. Uh, it's kind of an exciting thing. I, I was involved a little bit at the, the, the at the outset of this, but I, I'm not deeply involved at the moment. Um, Nokia is deploying. Uh, together with our with NASA. And this was actually something that we had planned with a startup, which went unfortunately defunct with Vodafone, uh, with the e, um, European Space Agency last year uh, in some partnership, uh, actually two years ago, and then it now has moved to NASA. So now we're gonna do 4G. I, I actually was kind of complaining. I said that we should do 6G on the moon. We shouldn't do 4G on the moon. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, they wanna be able to show that you can, easily, flexibly deploy and establish a network in a very remote place. So this is the extremum of 
a network automation and network deployment. There's nobody that's going to come out and fix the gear. Uh, there's nobody that's going to be able to solve the problems of uh, why uh, your connections are broken. So you better figure out how to make your network resilient and figure out how it's going to heal, um, how it's going to recover. So they chose 4G as a vector because of processing means as, as opposed to 5G or 6G. So um, the silicon uh, that we have for 5G is pretty new. Um, the silicon we have for 4G is radiation hardened. Um, the devices are radiation hardened, so you can operate on the moon, which doesn't have an atmosphere. Um, so that's for the reason for it. But yeah, this is a pretty exciting thing that's going to happen here this year is that we'll put a network on the moon. Um, I mentioned a little bit about AI earlier in terms of the context of being able to use it for uh, beam pattern optimization as a simple use case. Uh, there are tons of applications embedded in different layers of the RAN itself. Uh, whether we talk about things that we are doing for RF power amplifier linearization or for receivers, a lot of research activity on doing better channel estimation or better demapping. Uh, if you're a layer one guy, you know what that means, but essentially better algorithms for doing receiver optimization. Uh, a lot of work done in the scheduling side is also looking at opportunities to do power saving. Um, then as we move out of sort of the RAN itself, and I mentioned the challenges we have of uh, that the RAN itself has a lot to do and trying to embed more in there while also providing those very high data rates and support for all those antennas and those wider bandwidths becomes quite challenging. So we try to move stuff off, off the cell site and move it into other places or out of the radio and into an edge cloud. And so then you can benefit from being able to detect problems with the network, uh, be able to manage interference, uh, be able to do beam forming. These are interesting use cases and these are typically realized in or near the RIC. And um, then, of course, classical sort of centralized SON applications. We used to call it SON. Increasingly, I think it's becoming performance management via machine learning. Um, and this is essentially a, an ability to do things in a centralized location. Lots of opportunities, lots of interesting algorithms for machine learning folks to be able to apply technologies. And there are a number of startups and, and companies that are now trying to just provide the machinery, not, not even the algorithms, to be able to deploy um, learning as well as inference engines wherever they need to be deployed in the network. Um, and we're working with a number of these folks to be able to do that and realize very interesting use cases for the network itself. Um, I mentioned about energy efficiency in particular. Uh, there is, again, a lot of interest in what do you do to improve energy efficiency in the network. We have um, strong desires to, to do that. We spend a lot of energy, oh, energy. Um, we spend time on essentially optimization on silicon. So going to new line rule technologies essentially uh, gives us power benefit typically. So we go from um, 16 nanometers down to, to 10 nanometer or seven nanometer technology and implement, then we save on power consumption. It does allow us to also grow the density, um, sometimes both at the same time. So we do that with, with silicon. Uh, but then of course, there's lots of opportunity in changing the way that the network is managed to be more effective in how it uses energy, especially recognizing when there's less traffic to radiate less power, um, to simplify the operations, to, for example, do fewer beams. So this kind of thing is, is become very important and we'll expect to see this as a major driver and it may force fairly significant upgrades in the network itself before we get to the next G. So normally we see big upgrades that are, sorry, upgrades that are associated with each generation. Um, that's been sort of the cycle of the telecom business. Every 10 years we go through this major upgrade cycle, but because of the desire to perhaps minimize the amount of energy, there may be triggers to actually force significant changes in network architecture or significant changes in network gear simply because of energy efficiency. And so there we are. I think I'm not too far off, I think 7.30, and then we said we would have more open QA. I think we're almost to the end. Um, so what, what are we? So 5G is here now. I think the message I wanted to give you is, is that it's kind of um, a little early, uh, to be honest. I think we saw the acceleration, uh, the rapid acceleration from 4G to 5G and the pull up of standards in a very dramatic fashion. Now, they ended up splitting standards. There was a very ambitious plan put in place for 5G at the beginning that included changes to support um, mobile broadband, ultra reliable low latency communication, and also massive IoT. Um, those things were happen, uh, those happened, but uh, this got split into three releases. and. Uh, then that caused us to perhaps move forward millimeter wave uh, a bit in terms of the capability. So, but 5G is here now. Um, it was, it, it's interesting to see it sort of happen at such a rapid rate uh, relative to what we've seen for other 
other Gs. I think it created a lot of uh, challenges, I think, for us in particular at Nokia, but it, and other infrastructure vendors around the world to be able to meet the demand and be able to satisfy uh, what they needed specifically. Uh, big focus on innovation shifts to create a, a diverse sort of base of suppliers through ORAN, um, using virtualized RAN as an enabling te technology for those ecosystem suppliers. As people dig deep, they find out that virtualized RAN consumes more power, could be more costly potentially in physical hardware. You know, there's a lot of focus on trying to solve it. There's an opportunity for innovation. Wherever challenges are, there's always there's always opportunity. Um, so what we'll see now, you know, in the future, wireless innovation for 5G will now focus on automation and intelligent operation with even higher levels of integration. We talked about potentially uh, integrating more frequencies, more bandwidth, more complexity with respect to beamforming itself. And then, of course, finally, that 6G is coming. So maybe a second, uh, what is 6G? Uh, you know, just to say, finally, what is it? It's for us, when we think about it, it really is an enabling foundation for the future. So we tend to think in somewhat abstract terms because if, at the moment, we normally think of these Gs happening every 10 years. So 10 years from now, we'll be thinking about, we'll actually have commercial deployments of 6G. Now it may get accelerated. It's significantly accelerated because 5G. Um, so, and that's something that will, you know, will the industry will decide over the next year or two whether 5G has enough um, legs on it to carry uh, to be able to deliver the other cases, or finally we break a use case and say we really need 6G. But we start to see actually the need to blend, um, especially if you imagine a world which is so highly connected, to blend the digital world and the physical world in a in sort of a unique way. We won't necessarily know what is the distinction, what is the difference. So network and network connectivity has to essentially allow um, uh, a human to inter to interact with the world in a digital world and a physical world and maybe not know the difference. Um, or potentially a machine needs to interact with the digital world and the physical world and not know the difference. In order to enable that, that means that we have to evolve the network yet even further. Um, that will involve essentially a need to drive towards higher data rates, towards even lower latencies, and then finally to support even more devices on a physical network uh, without scaling, without limitation. So, so the real driver finally is for 6G is just more. More almost always seems to be better. So we'll see uh, that higher data rates, lower latency, and essentially more devices as a, as a principal driver. But in terms of the experience, in terms of the use case, this will be driven by the applications that are run on cloud-based servers more of the physical applications will shift to be closer to the edge of the network um, to enable these very low latency applications to run concurrently. So we're gonna see a lot of interesting things happen. I think we're sort of in the early days of research and research activities uh, around 6G. There's a lot of discussions around converging access and sensing. So the network itself becomes a, a, a network of sensors uh, and that sort of blends well with the idea of blending the physical world with uh, um, the digital world itself. And so I think that actually gets me more or less to the end. And I think we can have uh, opportunity for more questions. Thank you, Rob. Excellent presentation. Any, any questions from anyone before I can start asking? Thank you, Asif. It's good Thanks. to see you. Good to see you too, Rob. I guess I can turn that. We can hear you, Asif. We can hear you, Asif. Do you have a question, Asif? Or just yeah, I'm trying to think about uh, like sharing type thing. You know, the the other direction we are going in more is like saying Spectrum is at a premium and we want to share. And are there any things either in 5G down the road or 6G related to potentially facilitating sharing? Sharing in what sense? Like spectrum sharing, like CVRS is an example of spectrum sharing. Uh, you know, there's, there's a fair amount of mid-band spectrum that the government's talking about. So, uh, you know, is there something that can facilitate that? That's what I was thinking. Yeah, go ahead. So, so it's a good question. I guess, um, you know, spectrum sharing uh, for um, different types of enterprises, we tend to think almost classically in stuck in the CBRS model where you have 
prioritize service and it's uh, about getting off the network um, when a prioritized service guy shows up, a destroyer or an aircraft carrier pulls up to the coast and has lit up its radar, in which case you now need to get off that channel or get off that particular band that you're in to allow them to use their radar system. But yeah, there are a lot of other variety of flexible models with respect to spectrum sharing. Um, to some degree, they decouple uh, from the access stratum, just like for, for shared spectrum for existed in the 4G era before the 5G era. But there is uh, opportunities, I think, in the innovation space to do more rapid sharing or uh, rapid changes in who's using the spectrum due to technologies through DSS. So you can imagine um, use cases where you can use DSS to your advantage um, and use the underlying technology that we've built for, to enable DSS to enable faster sharing than what's currently sort of required by shared access servers. So there will be you know, needs or perhaps other things that will get created as a result of that. It's an interesting use case. I, I, I can't tell you that there are too many folks that are asking for that, except perhaps in an enterprise environment. You can imagine that um, an enterprise may want to share with an operator um, the license spectrum, and in which case, yeah, you can imagine very flexible models with DSS being deployed. So perhaps there's something there with 5G and DSS. So perhaps that's something that 6G could be one of the directions of research in 6G. Yeah, I think there's a lot of discussions about sharing spectrum. I think what, what they're trying to focus on right now in terms of the core technology enablers for 6G is, is more about um, in terahertz um, access of very wide bandwidths and, and also, again, more, uh, uh, more specific focus on um, uh, wider bandwidths or more antennas, et cetera. But yeah, I think, um, will there be a focus specific on shared access? Maybe not yet. We'll see. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Penta. Thank you. I have a question. Um, uh, are there any? Uh, is there any change in the uh, existence of, let's say, data sets that are usually curated from the community uh, to enable kind of ML and AI kind of applications at the RIC controller level, uh, like what is happening with the ML community that were basically data sets to do benchmarking on certain kind of use cases? Are there any openness on that side to create these data sets from the operators? that they usually have an oversight of the network so they can create fairly realistic kind of data sets for the community to uh, to start developing these applications. Yeah. I, I'm not aware of anything, but I think it's a good idea. Um, you know, definitely uh, you can imagine call trace data being made available once uh, user identification and network um, topologies were hidden in the data to to do such a thing. I mean, as long as the network topology wasn't what you were trying to uncover or discover, but um, there, there's definitely uh, opportunities, I think, with, or you could change it. I mean, you could always fake it. But there, there's definitely opportunity, I think, with whether it's for call measurement data or call trace data um, to think of that that could be useful to enable the ecosystem, as opposed to today, the way it typically works is an operator gains access to their own data to be able to release it to a third party. That third party is typically a startup. Startup only doesn't necessarily have the ability to do that. Um, it's, it's an interesting thing. I think I haven't heard much about this discussion, but you, you've definitely pinged a question. I mean, definitely you, you don't, you can't do machine learning without data and, and the kind of data that typically you would need is typically locked up in vaults uh, with the operators. And there's lots of agreements that have to be signed before then, but you wonder if you couldn't develop toy data sets. Um, I will be honest with you, there is at least one forward leaning operator that intends to essentially make all their data open. I see. Uh, they don't, they actually think that that is the way of the future. They plan to, uh, they think that will enable the ecosystem to move more rapidly, to have the startups be able to, to have the college kids be able mm -hmm. to play with it. I mean, that's a dream. I mean, it doesn't really happen in the open source community too often, to be honest, especially mm -hmm. in telecom. But yeah, there there is one operator in particular that is very interested in turning their network into a laboratory and then essentially making the data available to everyone. Not even curated, just totally open. Okay, I see. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, there are some questions on chat. Uh, oh, Ed, Ed was uh, signing off, I think. Um, anyone else? 
Any questions from uh, my class? <laughs> How big is your class, Pintas? Did they all come today? Uh, it's a it's a small class. Um, it's because of the uh, first time that we revamped this course. It used to be a very protocol oriented kind of course, but uh, it's has been completely revamped to do um, to do cognitive cloud. It's, it's a bit of a, a change. So that for the first year, we only had I think eight folks joining. Um, and uh, hopefully next year, we'll, when the class is a bit no, more known, we'll get some more. All right. Um, I don't hear any other questions. Uh, I would like to thank you. First of all, allow me to stop the recording. I don't want to... Uh,